Saturn is losing its rings. Thankfully, we won't be here to witness this sad event either. Apparently, the rings are being pulled into Saturn as a dusty rain of ice particles, all under the influence of Saturn's magnetic field. According to NASA's research, the ring rain is draining an amount of water products that could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool from Saturn's rings every half an hour. The entire ring system will likely be gone in 300 million years. Scientists believe we should consider ourselves lucky to witness Saturn's ring system at all, as it seems to be in the middle of its lifetime. But if you think about it that way, that rings around planets are all temporary, there's a chance we've just missed out on the giant ring system of Jupiter, or those of Uranus and Neptune. These planets have only thin ringlets around them these days. Scientists have long debated whether Saturn was formed together with its rings or if the planet acquired them later in life. The new research favors the second scenario, indicating that they are unlikely to be older than 100 million years, while Saturn itself is around 4.5 billion years old. What caused the rings to appear in the first place? Well, there are a few theories. One of them suggests the rings could have formed when small, icy moons in orbit around Saturn collided. Perhaps their own orbits were messed up by a gravitational tug from a passing asteroid or comet. Who knows what humans might end up looking like in the future? It's unlikely we'll see any major changes in our lifetime. But let's take a journey to the future and ponder what we might evolve into. Will we become cyborgs with all sorts of cool machine implants? Or maybe we'll become a hybrid species of biological and artificial beings. To understand our future evolution, we gotta take a peek at our past. A million years ago, Homo sapiens didn't even exist. There were a few other similar species though, like the Neanderthal. Fast forward to today and humans have become taller and sturdier. Maybe in the future we'll become smaller to conserve energy as it's predicted that our planet will get more crowded. Speaking of crowded planets, living in these new conditions means we have to adapt and fast. We're constantly interacting with lots of people and remembering names is becoming a crucial skill. Luckily, technology might help us out with brain implants that will improve our memory. In the future, we might also have more noticeable technologies as part of our appearance. Imagine having an artificial eye with a camera that can read different frequencies of light. While predicting a million years into the future is pure speculation, we can use bioinformatics to make some predictions about the immediate future. Demographic trends suggest that urban areas will become more genetically diverse, while rural areas will become less diverse. And what about space? If we end up colonizing Mars, our bodies could change due to lower gravity. Maybe we'll have longer arms and legs, or even insulating body hair like our Neanderthal cousins. In the future, our moon is also going to witness some dramatic changes. We'll miss these ones too. In about 5 billion years, things are going to get really interesting in this corner of the universe. For now, the sun is chilling in its main sequence phase, just burning hydrogen like nobody's business. In the future, during the red giant phase, the sun is going to puff up like a balloon until its atmosphere reaches out and engulfs our beloved Earth and Moon. Our natural satellite, which is already moving away from Earth, is going to get warped around the sun's influence. Its orbit will get all wonky and it'll end up closer to Earth during the new moon phase than during the full moon. And that's not even the worst part. If left alone, the moon would keep on moving away from Earth until it'll need almost 50 days to orbit us. As the sun continues with its own journey, its atmosphere will drag on the moon and cause its orbit to decay. Eventually, the moon will get torn apart into a stunning ring of debris circling Earth. We're talking about all its mountains, craters, and even the footprints and flags we left there, all scattered throughout the debris field. 
there's a chance the sun will shed enough mass to spare Earth and the moon from total annihilation. Or if we're really lucky, the sun will lose 20% of its mass and we'll be safe and sound. It's all just theory right now, we haven't seen a red giant star during this phase. The universe itself might go completely dark one day too. Scientists can't predict it with absolute certainty, but they can make some educated guesses. Right now, our universe is 13.77 billion years old, and it's still churning out new stars left and right. It's said that eventually, after about 1 trillion years, the last star will be born. That final star will be a little guy, a red dwarf, just a fraction the size of our sun. These stars are champs at living long lives, slowly sipping on hydrogen to keep their fusion reactions going. But even they can't last forever. Fast forward about 100 trillion years and the last light will go out. The universe will be dark and lonely, but thankfully we won't be here to watch it all fade away. Do you recognize this majestic world? The second largest planet from the sun? Check. A gas giant with a hazy yellow-brown appearance? Check. Seven huge, intimidating rings? Check. You're right, it can't be anything else but Saturn. And recently, the Hubble Space Telescope has made an astonishing discovery. Apparently, the planet's rings have been doing something to the planet for a long time. A new study has revealed that these iconic rings are heating Saturn's upper atmosphere. The coolest thing, though, is that researchers from NASA claim that it's something scientists have never observed anywhere else in our solar system. This secret has been hiding in plain view for 40 years, and only after using the observations of the planet received from the Hubble Space Telescope and retired Cassini probe and Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft did astronomers figure it out. This unexpected interaction of the gas giant with its rings could become a tool for predicting if planets in other star systems have magnificent Saturn-like ring systems as well. So, how did it become clear that the gas planet is being slowly cooked by its own rings? The telltale evidence is an excess amount of ultraviolet radiation. It can be seen as a spectral line of hot hydrogen in the atmosphere of the gas giant. There's a bump in radiation that can only mean that something is heating the upper atmosphere from the outside. It's still kinda unclear how this process is happening, but the most probable explanation is that icy ring particles rain down on Saturn and cause this heating. But it might also be the impact of tiny meteorites or the particles of solar wind. The heating could be caused by solar ultraviolet radiation or some electromagnetic forces that pick up electrically charged dust. When NASA's Cassini probe finished its mission and plunged into Saturn's atmosphere, it had enough time to measure the atmospheric components. And it turned out that many particles were indeed falling from its rings. But in any case, the heating process happens under the influence of the gravitational field of the gas giant. You see, astronomers do know about the slow disintegration of Saturn's rings, but figuring out how this process affects the planet? That's new. Now, do you remember NASA's Cassini spacecraft I mentioned before? For more than a decade, it was studying Saturn, sharing images of the gas giant and its icy moons. It took us to marvelous worlds where methane rivers ran into methane seas and jets of gas and ice were blasting material into space. Anyway, that very Cassini also studied Saturn's magnetosphere. The thing is, forces acting deep inside the planet produce a ginormous magnetic bubble under the planet. And this bubble is called the magnetosphere. Unfortunately, astronomers still have very little information about this phenomenon on Saturn, since magnetic fields are invisible and are, of course, best studied from within. Imagine this. Million mile per hour flows of electrically charged particles from the Sun, aka solar wind, are spreading through the solar system. Suddenly, something appears in their way. Oh, it's Saturn's magnetic field! It protects the planet, making solar particles back away. 
As a result, the sun's magnetic forces are raging outside Saturn's magnetosphere, while inside the gas giant's protective bubble, its own magnetic forces dominate. Our home planet also has a magnetic field, but it creates a much smaller magnetosphere. And still, it effectively protects us from the harmful particles coming from the sun and from space. But even though Saturn is protected by its magnetosphere, the sun still manages to mess with the planet. Energetic winds from our star sweep over the gas giant, causing massive auroras. But unlike auroras here, on Earth, Saturn's auroras can only be seen in ultraviolet light. In other words, they're invisible from Earth's surface. You can only see them if you travel to space. But apparently, there are different kinds of auroras on the gas giant. For example, one more type is triggered by the charged particles coming from volcanic eruptions on the planet's moons. And some of Saturn's auroras might be caused by powerful winds swirling in the planet's own atmosphere. These winds blow in the ionosphere, which is a region located beneath the magnetosphere. The same winds might be responsible for the variable rotation rate of the planet. This phenomenon makes it difficult for scientists to figure out how long one day on the ringed planet lasts. Speaking of winds, Saturn has a mysterious vortex swirling over the planet's south pole. The whole thing resembles an enormous hurricane-like storm on Earth, but its eye alone measures almost 2,500 miles across. For comparison, the eye of a typical terrestrial hurricane is a mere 2 to 3 miles wide. What confuses astronomers is that although the phenomenon looks like a hurricane, it doesn't behave like one. It's stationary and keeps spinning over the same area of the South Pole. And while polar vortices on Earth have cold cores, the one on Saturn is warm. And now, brace yourself for another surprise Saturn has prepared for us. In an image sent to Earth by the Hubble Space Telescope, one can notice a couple of dark, shadowy spots on the left side of the planet's rings. Those are informally called spokes, maybe because they resemble spokes on a bicycle. The shading and shape of spokes vary. They may seem dark or light, it depends on the angle and illumination. Sometimes they may even look like blobs rather than something with a classical radial spoke shape. They also don't last long. But the good news is more and more will start to appear the closer we are to May 6, 2025. That's when the autumnal equinox on Saturn will occur. Now on Earth, that's the moment when the Sun is exactly above the equator of the planet and day and night are of the same length. But on Earth, it's something a bit different. Like our planet, Saturn is tilted on its axis. That's why it has four seasons. But since the orbit of the gas giant is much larger, each of these seasons lasts about seven Earth years. An equinox occurs when Saturn's rings are tilted edge on to the Sun. But what causes the spokes? Astronomers think it might be the gas giant's magnetic field. When a planetary magnetic field interacts with the solar wind, it creates an electrically charged environment. As we already know, on Earth, this results in northern lights, also called aurora borealis. And if we speak about Saturn, the tiniest icy ring particles might get charged too. And it probably temporarily levitates these particles above the larger boulders in the rings. For the first time, the spokes in Saturn's rings were spotted by NASA's Voyager mission. It happened in the early 1980s. At that time, we didn't know that these spokes were a seasonal phenomenon. Voyager 2 just passed by the planet, after all, and then sped on. To figure out what these spokes were and how they functioned, astronomers needed a space telescope that could observe Saturn's rings from afar, like Hubble. The latest equinox on Saturn occurred in 2009, that's when the Cassini space probe was traveling around the gas giant. It sent many amazing images back to Earth. It managed to prove quite quickly that the spokes weren't caused by gravitational interactions with Saturn or the influence of the gas giant's moons or small moonlets, which make up the planet's rings. It was the year 2005 when Cassini confirmed that the spokes were related to Saturn's magnetic field. 
And even though that mission was finished in 2017, now Hubble keeps its long-term monitoring of the changes on and around Saturn. Despite all the observations, astronomers still can't predict the beginning and duration of the spoke season. Luckily, Saturn's prominent rings are a perfect laboratory for studying this phenomenon, because even though other gas giants in the solar system also have rings, those are not so visible. And scientists don't know whether spokes occur on those planets. Now, Jupiter used to be flat and look like an M&M candy. Now I'm hungry. And it wasn't the only flat pattern in our solar system. Turns out, there are tons of things that can go wrong during a planet's formation, like locking up to the sun or getting whooshed into open space. Let's check it out. The Earth isn't flat, but Jupiter might have been. Instead of being a big round ball, gas giants in our system might have started more like flat pancakes. Jupiter is one of the oldest of our neighbors. It's 4.6 billion years old, just like our Sun. And when it was just a baby planet, it likely formed through a process called disk instability. It all begins with stars. When a star is forming, it doesn't look like a round object. It's more like a big disk of stuff. During this stage, really hot winds made of charged particles blow out. The dust in that disk contains stuff like carbon and iron. Some of them collide and stick together, forming bigger objects. Dust turns into pebbles, pebbles turn into rocks, and rocks bump into each other, getting bigger. Gas in the disks helps all these solid bits stick together. Some break apart, but others stick around, and they're the ones that become the basic pieces of planets. They're called planetesimals. Even gas giants like Jupiter started off as tiny specks of dust, smaller than a human hair. Eventually, they formed their own big ring-shaped disks of gas. They began to spin around our Sun, growing bigger by gathering gas and rocks like snowballs. Gas giants are special. They were born from the colder parts of the disk. In cold areas, molecules are slower, which makes them easier to grab. In these places, water could freeze, and tiny ice pieces stick together and are mixed with dust. These dirty snowballs gather up and then form cores of huge planets, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In the warmer areas closer to the star, rocky planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars start to form. After the icy giants were born, there wasn't much gas left for these smaller planets. It might take tens of millions of years for these rocky planets to form after the star is born. And our sun was growing at the same time, sucking up nearby gas and pushing far away stuff even farther out. After billions of years, the disk changed completely, turning into a round star with a bunch of planets, dwarf planets, asteroids, moons, meteoroids, and comets around it. Recently, simulations showed that these protoplanets as these early dust balls are called, don't start off looking like the planets we know. In the case of gas giants like Jupiter, they look more like squashed balls or M&M's candies, not the peanut kind. When the sun was young, the disk of gas and dust surrounding it cooled down and became unstable. It started breaking into big chunks. These chunks dramatically collapsed together under huge gravity to create Jupiter. It became a round gas giant over time. There are a lot of oddities that can happen during that process of planet formation. Ever wonder why Venus or Uranus spin in the opposite way compared to other planets? Usually, when things form from a spinning disk of gas, they tend to spin in the same direction. For example, if you spin a bunch of balls on a string, they all twirl in the same way. So, theoretically, all planets should spin in the same direction too. But there are a lot of fast-moving objects, like comets and asteroids, in our solar system. When they smash into planets, especially during their early days, this collision might send the planets to spin in the opposite direction. Venus and Uranus probably survived a massive collision. Luckily, they weren't repelled to outer space. The gravity from the Sun and nearby planets pulled them back into place. There are also so-called tidally locked planets. These are celestial bodies that spin in a way where one side always faces their star, while the other side remains in perpetual darkness. So one side is always very hot, while the other is extremely cold. Mm. 
If we were on a planet like that, we would only be able to live on a thin line in between. These planets form when they're very close to their star. The gravitational forces are extremely strong, and over time, these forces slow down the planet's rotation until it matches the time it takes to orbit the star. Imagine you're spinning in your chair. Someone comes up to you and, holding onto your chair with their hands, starts spinning with you. This way, you'll always face each other. Tidally locked planets kind of work like that. Our moon is tidally locked to our Earth, which is why we only see one side of it. We've discovered more than 5,000 planets outside of our solar system called exoplanets. Some of them have very strange orbits. For example, planets with incredibly long orbits, thousands of years to make one trip around the star, or very wonky, comet-like orbits, or so-called hot Jupiters. They're super close to their star, way closer than Mercury is to our Sun. But these planets couldn't have formed where they are now. As their solar system evolved, they changed their positions for some reason. This rearranging is called planetary migration. There are three main ways this migration happens. First, because of the gas and dust spinning around the planet. When a planet is bumping into this stuff, it can create spiral patterns in the gas. These patterns can either push the planet closer to the center or farther away, depending on how they mix together. It's called a gas-driven migration. This is what Jupiter experienced when it moved closer to the Sun billions of years ago. I wasn't around then. This also explains the existence of hot Jupiters. Second, big planets can shove the smaller ones, changing their paths. Third, the star's gravity can tug on the planet, making its orbit more circular. Ever heard of rogue planets? Imagine a lonely planet floating in the vastness of space without a star to call home. They're like the wandering nomads of our galaxy, doomed to drift around forever. And there are so many of them, there might be more free-floating planets than ones that are tied to stars. We're talking trillions of rogue planets hanging out in our Milky Way galaxy alone. They're often as massive as our biggest planet, Jupiter. But most of them might be Earth-sized. Some might even have thick atmospheres that keep them warm, even though they're far from any star. Some of them might have wild auroras, while others could host moons with liquid water, a potential haven for life. There's even a chance that they might contain extraterrestrial life. These planets might bump into other stars or even entire planetary systems as they journey through space. Sometimes they might get caught in a star's gravity for a while before getting flung back out into space. But how are they born? Sometimes, during this chaotic process of planet formation, not all planets can manage to stay close to their parent stars. Some of them get kicked out of their solar systems due to powerful gravitational interactions with other planets or passing stars. These ejected planets become rogue planets. In 2012, astronomers found a solar system from the very beginning of the universe. The system included a star and two planets. We called it a fossil system. The star is super old, about 13 billion years, almost as old as our entire universe. It was mostly made of just hydrogen and helium. This is unusual because planets usually form from clouds of gas that contain heavier stuff. That's when we figured out that the way planets formed before was different from how they form now. We know that stars with more metals are more likely to have planets. In astronomy lingo, metals means any chemical element other than hydrogen and helium. But in the early universe, there weren't many metals. Most of them were created inside stars and then spread out into space when those stars blew up. So when did the very first planets form? This newly discovered system helps answer these questions. Its two giant planets are orbiting a star that's incredibly low in metals and extremely old. This should be really rare, if not impossible, but they exist. This means that maybe there are more planets in metal-poor systems than we thought. Studying them will help us learn more about the history of planet formation. Imagine a world where the red, barren landscape of Mars is transformed into a lush and verdant garden. A world where water flows freely, carving canyons and creating lakes and oceans. Can we achieve such a world by pouring the Earth's water onto the surface of Mars? 
and don't rush to say no. Let's explore this possibility. All right, let's say we could magically transport all of the water on Earth to Mars. This supersized game of water pong would be crazy in both engineering and logistics. So how do we even do that? First of all, we're talking about millions and millions of gallons of water, which is no small feat. We would need some really big tanks to get all this water off the Earth. We would also have to figure out how to launch it all into space. This would require some serious rocket technology, as well as a lot of fuel. We could probably create an entire fleet of spacecraft specifically designed for the task. Just imagine that, a fleet of giant water tankers packed with tons of carefully harvested water blasting off from Earth's surface and hurtling through space at unimaginable speeds. Wouldn't that be a cool sight? Now, another way. Probably a better one would be to launch a large number of smaller missions over time, each carrying a smaller amount of water until enough of it has been transported to Mars. So, let's say we manage to do all that. What happens next? After we get to Mars, we'd need to distribute this water all across the planet. We could use a network of underground pipes or some special drones to transport the water to different locations. This is just some basic things, and as you can see, we already need a lot of planning and resources. Moreover, a crazy operation like this would require a massive coordinated effort from scientists, engineers, and space agencies all over the world. And let's not forget about the costs. No wonder that scientists don't really consider it a viable plan. But the scale of this operation isn't the only problem. Hypothetically, let's say that we figured all that out and poured the Earth's water on Mars. Now what? Well, believe it or not, it would be almost completely useless. Our main challenge will be the atmosphere and current climate of Mars. Mars is a dry desert with an atmosphere that's only about 1% as thick as Earth's. This means that any water poured onto the surface would quickly evaporate. It would be pretty hard to create a stable environment when the entire lake can go poosh in a matter of seconds. And if the water doesn't evaporate, then, on the contrary, it will turn into ice. Mars's surface temperature is well below freezing. Thin atmosphere only makes things worse. Another challenge is that Mars has a very weak magnetic field, which means it has little protection from the solar wind. Solar wind is a stream of charged particles that are constantly flowing out from the sun. These winds are pretty dangerous. They can strip away any water that's put on the Mars surface. Also, the solar radiation on Mars is much stronger than on Earth. This would make it even more difficult to maintain any liquid water there. And finally, don't forget that we also need to purify this water to remove all the bacteria before drinking it. But let's not give up. If we stay super optimistic, we can still try to solve these problems. Basically, we need to find a way to maintain liquid water in one place for a long time and make sure that it doesn't freeze or evaporate. So how do we do it? There are a few ways we can go about it. Number one, insulation. We could wrap all the water containers in insulation materials, like foam for example, or some reflective materials that can help to keep the water from freezing. Number two, heating. We could use various heaters and devices to keep the temperatures above freezing, even thermal blankets. Although this would require a lot of energy and would be a difficult task. Number three, underground reservoirs. We could dig a large hole and cover it with a transparent material to allow sunlight to pass through. This would help keep the water warm and insulated. Number four, salinity. Adding a small amount of salt or other dissolved minerals to water can lower its freezing point. Although we'll need much more salt for things like lakes, and this method isn't the most efficient. And finally, number five, building a greenhouse. We could build a greenhouse or some other structure that can trap heat and create a more Earth-like environment. This option is probably the best one. After all, a greenhouse would also help us to grow various plants or other organisms. Yay, life! All right, great. Let's say we've discovered some way to store water on Mars and keep it there in a liquid, lukewarm state. What now? What impact would this have on Mars? Actually, this would be great. 
If we were to pour all this water on Mars, it could have drastically changed the climate of this cold, red desert. First of all, we could create a so-called greenhouse effect. It's when gases in a planet's atmosphere trap heat, causing the planet's temperature to rise. And yeah, this is pretty bad for Earth, but for Mars, whose temperatures jump between 70 and negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it would be awesome. This could cause the atmosphere to thicken and lead to the melting of the polar ice caps. Wouldn't that be awesome? Mars would begin to gradually turn from a lonely desert into Earth 2.0. It also means that the planet's atmosphere will change. For example, the weather patterns. Clouds could form on Mars, rains would begin to fall. And rains, as we know, transfer water from one region to another, which would mean they could water plants if they appeared on Mars. But all of this is pure speculation. We can't be completely sure what kind of impact pouring water on the Martian surface would have on the planet's climate. Perhaps, to create this greenhouse effect, we would need much more water than what we can transport. But if despite all these challenges, we had succeeded with our mission and made Mars much warmer and moist, could life have been finally born there? Um, unfortunately, that would still be pretty unlikely. Yes, water is very important for creating life, but that's not all we need. The composition of the Martian soil isn't very conducive to supporting life. The soil is mostly made of minerals called regolith, which are composed mainly of dust, sand, and other materials that aren't very good for plants. Theoretically, we could terraform Mars. Terraforming is a gradual, slow change of the planet so that it becomes suitable for our life, but this would be a very complex, long, and costly process. Oh, and by the way, what would happen to our Earth after all that? We took quite a lot of water, didn't we? From Earth's perspective, transporting water to Mars would require an enormous amount of resources, including energy and different materials. And the amount of water we'd have to spend would be staggering. The loss of such a large amount of water from Earth's own reserves could have a significant impact on our planet especially in areas where water is already scarce. So basically, this is a really bad idea, no matter how you look at it. Yeah, it may sound interesting, but it's not a viable plan at all. It would require too many resources, too much money, and it wouldn't even be worth it. That's why scientists and space agencies don't consider this idea seriously. Besides, there are many other more realistic and achievable goals in the field of Mars exploration. For example, we can keep studying the planet's geology, atmosphere, and potential for past or present life. These studies would help us to find some resources that could support future human exploration. Overall, we need to answer many more questions about Mars before we even begin to consider colonizing it. So let's keep an eye on scientific news and updates. Do me a favor, will you? Try to imagine the first time you went camping. Maybe you went with your parents. Maybe it happened on a class field trip with your schoolmates. Regardless, try to picture, or remember, what it felt like as the day was coming to an end. The sun has set, but there's still some light outside. Let's say you were lying down, trying to rest for a bit. What's the first thing you remember seeing when looking up? If you're anything like me, it was probably the overwhelming number of stars twinkling right before you. These stars, most of which you can see without any fancy devices, are part of the Milky Way. Believe it or not, our amazing galaxy is almost as old as the universe itself. Age aside, it's also a pretty nice place to be. The Milky Way is like a cosmic nursery where new stars are born. And let me tell you, it's home to some of the most fascinating places, at least from what we can see in pictures. Take the Mystic Mountain, an area in the Carina Nebula. Here, things are always splashing and full of energy. That's because of gas columns collapsing and creating crazy opposing jets that are thrown around like acrobats in a circus. It's like a signature move for stars being born, you know? And if you take a look at this awesome picture, you'll see the elements putting on a colorful show. Blue represents oxygen, Green is for hydrogen and nitrogen, and red is the sizzling sulfur. 
Ready for our next stop on our ride through the Milky Way? Check out these huge twisted clouds of interstellar dust and gas hanging out in the center of M16, also known as the Eagle Nebula. We've got ourselves the super cool Pillars of Creation, which are like towering columns where brand new stars like to hide and chill. Now, I know this ain't the first time the Hubble telescopes captured this epic sight, but trust me, this is the most mind-blowingly detailed image yet. The pillars are getting showered with crazy hot ultraviolet light from a bunch of young stars hanging just outside the frame. These stellar superstars are actually causing the towers of dust and gas to gradually get worn away by their gusty winds. Brace yourself for the numbers, too. These pillars of creation stretch out for about four to five light years. Yeah, it sounds big, but in the grand scheme of things, they're kind of like the cute little siblings of the larger Eagle Nebula, which spans a whopping 70 by 55 light years. The nebula was first spotted back in 1745 by an awesome Swiss astronomer, and it's about 7,000 light years away from our humble abode in the constellation Serpents. Here's the quirky part, though. As productive as it might sound, the Milky Way's star-forming activity is quite rare when compared to other galaxies. Astronomers have noticed that the pace at which stars are being born is actually dropping, and they're itching to figure out why. But before we can dive into this weird phenomenon, let's look at how stars come into existence in the first place. It's hard for us to know for sure from down here. What we can gather about a star's life cycle comes from looking at those within our local Milky Way. Stars are formed in colder clouds of gas and dust called nebulae. These areas are pretty common throughout most galaxies. These nebulae have low temperatures that are crucial for hydrogen gas to stick together. As the clump gathers more gas, it causes movement, which itself creates energy. When more gas collides with the already formed clump, all that energy transforms into heat. This keeps going until the temperature grows considerably, sparking the birth of a star. The most secure time of a star's life is also known as its main sequence. I'll spare you the chemistry lesson, but during this time, the star produces both heat and radiation. It's because of the radiation that there's pressure around a star, and it's also the reason for most of the light found in a certain galaxy. Now let's talk star sizes. The bigger the star, the faster it consumes its fuel. These massive stars shine the brightest, emitting high energy UV light. On the other hand, lower mass brighties live longer, despite not being as shiny as their larger siblings. There's a variety of star sizes in most galaxies we're able to see from down here. Some stars are 0.1% the size of the sun, while others have 10 times its mass. Once a star finishes up its fuel, it welcomes its grand finale and transforms into a faded star. Stars about the same size as the sun or smaller can no longer produce radiation at this stage. Gravity takes over causing their matter to settle into a white dwarf. For bigger stars, the timeline changes a bit. They too collapse, but there's a lot more stuff burning, and it's also hotter in there. This collapse creates a stronger core. When all of the stars' insides are done for, the outer layers collapse in a jiffy. It bounces off the core at nearly the speed of light, it's an impressive, explosive event called a supernova. The blown out material becomes the basis for future stars. It also leaves behind a black hole. Now that we know a bit about a star's life, let's try to look at each generation, if you'd like. Stars don't just pop up constantly at the same rate. Currently, the universe is manufacturing only about one-ninth the number of stars compared to its star-forming glory days, which happened roughly 10 billion years ago. One study gave us a peek on the history of star forming. In writing it, two scientists teamed up to gather a ton of data about galaxies. 
They sorted these galaxies based on how far away they were. By doing this, they could track how the brightness of galaxies has changed over the universe's lifetime. Since stars give off most of a galaxy's light, they could use that brightness to figure out how many stars were forming using some fancy math. Their findings confirmed that star formation was pretty wimpy when the universe was young. But as gas started to gather in galaxies, boom! Star formation skyrocketed until about 10 to 11 billion years ago when it hit its peak. After that, star formation took a nosedive. In today's observable universe, it's dropped a lot. That means around 50% of the stars we see today were born in the first 5 billion years post Big Bang. A mere quarter formed in the last 6 billion years. So what's causing this cosmic shift? Well, scientists think it's all about that cold gas that stars need when they're born. When galaxies form, the gas gets concentrated inside, leading to a star formation extravaganza. But then, the gas is used up quickly as stars doze off. When supernovae come into play, they blast away that much-needed gas for future star making. Not to mention it also changes the chemistry of that gas. This crucial piece of information could be a starting point for the star-making decline we see today. Scientists are still not sure why this gas becomes useless. Galaxies are also pretty complex to begin with. There are all sorts of forces involved in maintaining their balance. For instance, when a supernova goes boom, the shock waves can sometimes cause turbulence and clumping of the gas, sparking the birth of new stars. But if the supernova is too wild, it can blast that same gas right out of the galaxy. With no gas left in the area, there's little to no chance a new star could form. Now, what does the future hold? Some scientists can't help but wonder what might happen if no new stars pop up. The universe might be simply filled with black holes and fading stars. Solar systems would become inhospitable as their stars lose power, and those ravenous black holes might munch on whatever material is left. As gloomy as it seems, you do have to admit it's a mind-boggling concept. Luckily, we don't have to worry about it happening anytime soon. The universe is a whopping 13.7 billion years old, but the dark era isn't expected to kick in until somewhere way further in the future. But hey, this is just one possible outcome of the decline in star formation. Who knows what other wacky possibilities the universe holds? See this? You're looking at the best full portrait of the sun by far. Thankfully, our 4.5 billion year old parent star didn't use any makeup to fix its skin tone before this photo shoot. And now we can study its surface in great detail. This iconic image was taken in March 2022. NASA wanted to gain a better understanding of solar behavior and its impact on life on Earth, and the future of our space technologies, of course. To do so, they launched the Solar Dynamics Observatory Satellite, or SDO, mission in February 2010. This legendary photo shoot happened 12 years later, when SDO was halfway between the Earth and the Sun. Scientists had to assemble 25 individual images like a puzzle. So the final image contains 83 million pixels. Yeah, the resolution is about 10 times better than your fancy 4K TV screen. Look at this amazing cookie-like pattern. Typically, the bright surface of the sun overshadows it when we observe the star from Earth. Thankfully, NASA explored the light beyond the visible range, which allowed them to discover some invisible details of the sun's face. When you adjust your selfie with filters and effects, you can end up with completely different portraits, highlighting different spots of your face, even those you didn't know existed. Hmm. The same principle works here. All these plasma balls are the same photo of the sun captured at different electromagnetic wavelengths. The revealed spots and patterns can help us understand events happening inside the sun's skin a little better. At the speed of light is supposed to mean super quick. But this rose gold ray caressing your cheek at dawn has come a long way and is incredibly old in human terms. Photons generated by the sun's core take between 10,000 to 170,000 years to travel through the star's atmosphere. 
and then around 8 minutes more to reach Earth. So let's explore what's taking them so long. Our tour begins with the upper layer of the Sun's atmosphere. Remember solar deities in movies and theater plays? They often wear luxurious crowns with golden rays. Well, the real Sun does wear a fancy corona too, which is the outer layer of its atmosphere. But of course, its size and glory are incomparable with those plastic costume crowns. And its shape is not so stable. Corona is a gas shell enveloping our parent star, so its size and form constantly fluctuate under the influence of the Sun's magnetic field. You can spot this crown with the naked eye from Earth during total solar eclipses. It looks like a beautiful, intense radiation around the solar disk, which itself is completely blocked by the Moon. The corona stretches 5 million miles above the Sun's surface, whereas our blue planet is only about 8,000 miles in diameter. So, one hypothetical ray of the corona equals a row of about 625,000 Earth-sized planets. And suddenly, all my problems begin to seem tiny. Now here's another fun fact. The Sun's corona kind of breaks the laws of known physics because it's hotter than it should be. Its temperature reaches 2 million degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the surface of the Sun is only about 9,000 degrees. Although the word only doesn't fit here, because it's still super warm in human terms. Usually, temperature tends to fall as you move farther from a heat source. But it's not the case here. Space scientists are still scratching their heads trying to investigate this mystery. Thankfully, the recent photo shoot allows us to explore what's going on inside this massive hot stuff without risking losing our sight. Take these beautiful bright spots, for example. They depict solar flares happening under the corona layer. Solar flares are powerful explosions that happen when magnetic fields bump into each other. When it happens, they change shape and quickly reorganize. These fields arise from plasma, which is very turbulent itself, so these events are no surprise for the local weather. Now who would have thought that the sun has dark spots on its skin, just like people? These darker areas are known as coronal holes. Earthlings can experience their impact when they observe the beautiful aurora lights in the polar regions. Coronal holes look darker because plasma in these spots is cooler, less dense, and magnetically open. These conditions allow the solar winds to escape outward across the solar system rather than hang out at the sun's surface. And when they bump into the Earth's magnetosphere, auroras emerge to fascinate our eyes. Thankfully, the local fields cool down the solar winds. Nobody wants their eyes to melt, right? Now, if we were looking for an analogy to the sun's hairs, the best candidate would be solar prominences. These large, bright plasma loops arise from the sun's surface and stretch for thousands of miles into space. Their lifespan varies from days to several months. It's one of the most common events in this region. Although the first detailed description of solar prominence dates to the 14th century, modern scientists are still researching how and why they're formed. Diving further inwards, we're facing the transition region. The thickness of this layer is about 62 miles, and the local weather is unthinkable. <laughs> Temperatures can rise up to 900,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The transition layer sits between the corona and the last region of the sun's atmosphere, called the chromosphere. Now, speaking of which, welcome to our next stop. The chromosphere region is famous for a scientific mystery called a spicule. Come on, say it with me. Spicule. Yeah, that's fun. These spectacular grassy-like jets of plasma fire upwards from the surface of the sun and reach speeds of approximately 224 miles per second, as if they're jumping on a trampoline from the surface of the sun. Each spicule lasts for just a few minutes in outer space before falling back into the solar atmosphere. Astronauts were having a challenging time trying to explain how magnetically charged particles could manage to escape the massive gravity of the Sun while being so close to it. The possible answer emerged in 2017. A group of scientists discovered that neutral particles provided the magnetically charged particles with extra buoyancy to escape the solar gravity for a while. Which is better than my cousin's explanation, which is happy thoughts and pixie dust. Yeah. Now let's go ahead and travel 1,000 miles inward toward the chromosphere to finally reach the solar surface, the photosphere. It's around 248 miles thick. But unlike planet Earth, the sun's surface is not solid or stable at all. The temperatures here are insanely hot for any matter to exist. 
On the other hand, scientists often call plasma the fourth state of matter. And why not? It's made of ionized atoms and free electrons, so it kind of deserves to matter. So what's the matter? <laughs> Maybe someday we'll happen to meet the local civilization of plasmoid people. But I think it's best that we skip their welcoming warm hugs. You know, hot hot hot. Anyway, the photosphere is our final stop, because humankind doesn't have the technology to explore the sun any deeper. So if you want to learn more, you'll have to invent your own spacecraft. But time's a wasting. You'll only have about 7 to 8 billion years. After that, our sun will fade away, according to scientists' estimates. Actually, those same scientists will be going first. Now you have a serious competitor, though. NASA's Parker Solar Probe is the current champion for the deepest dive into the sun. The spacecraft managed to travel 4.5 million miles from the sun's surface toward its core on September 27, 2023. And then the Parker Probe repeated its own record once again in December of the same year. So why didn't it melt, I hear you asking? The probe has been designed to withstand insanely intense conditions and temperature fluctuations. It's equipped with a custom heat shield and an autonomous system protecting the mission from the massive solar lights. NASA has further ambitious plans. In December 2024, Parker will make its closest approach to the Sun. It will travel faster than any man-made object has ever traveled, at the speed of 435,000 miles per hour. The probe will be just 3.8 million miles away from the Sun's glowing hot surface. It's like landing on a star. Astronomers have already compared this epic upcoming milestone with the moon landing. I'm thinking, however, it might be safer if we, you know, landed at night. Yeah, you're right, that's an old joke. Ah, space. The final frontier. It's a vast and mysterious expanse that has fascinated us for centuries. But as much as we've learned about it, there are still plenty of things that we've been lied to about when it comes to space. Let's take a look at some of the biggest lies we've been told about this topic. First off, we have the idea that space is just this pristine, untouched wilderness. But that's not exactly true. We've been littering space with our debris for decades. Everything from old satellites to rocket parts. In fact, there are over 20,000 pieces of debris orbiting Earth right now, and they're causing all sorts of problems for future space missions. So if you're planning on visiting space anytime soon, watch where you go. You never know what kind of garbage might be floating around. Did you know that the sun is not actually yellow? It's green. Well, kind of. You see, scientists measure the temperature of a star by the color spectrum it emits. Cooler stars appear red, while the hottest of stars look blue. Our sun emits most of its energy at a wavelength that's close to green. But because it emits other wavelengths too, all these colors mix together and your eyes see this vibrant mixture as white. From Earth, however, the sun looks yellow because our atmosphere is really good at scattering blue light. If our star was actually yellow, Earth would become a frozen rock and we'd all be polar bears. Plus, the sun isn't on fire for real. It's a big ball of gas, mostly made of hydrogen and helium and it works more like a gigantic nuclear reactor, constantly fusing hydrogen atoms to create helium inside its core. This process releases enormous amounts of energy. That's why the sun is so hot. Oh, and speaking of setting things on fire, explosions in space aren't real. Sorry, Star Wars fans. A spaceship can't go down in a violent blast because there is no air out there in space. No air means no oxygen. And no oxygen means no fire. Now, you might also think that there are too many stars in the night sky for you to count. But in fact, you can do that. According to the Yale Bright Star Catalog, there are 9,110 stars that you can see from Earth with the unaided eye. So, technically, you can count them, but I wouldn't be surprised if you lost count. And if you're worried about flying through an asteroid belt, don't be. Although it does have trillions of space rocks that range in size from space dust to a quarter of the size of the Moon, they're very spread out. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter is 140 million miles across, 
which is one and a half times the distance between Earth and the Sun. This spreads space rocks thousands of miles apart, making it almost impossible for a spacecraft to collide with one. You'll instantly freeze in space without a suit. Nope, you won't turn into a popsicle right away. It's going to take a bit longer than that because heat and cold don't really move very quickly in the vacuum of space. But unfortunately for you, there's a bigger problem at hand. You won't be able to breathe. After just 15 seconds, your brain won't be getting enough oxygen from your blood and you'll pass out. And then after just two minutes, it's curtains for the rest of your organs. So, in short, if you find yourself playing astronaut without a spacesuit, it's game over pretty quickly. Did you know that space doesn't have any temperature at all? That's because the temperature is defined by the speed at which particles move and the amount of energy they have. In the true vacuum of space, there are no particles to move around, making it temperatureless. Of course, some parts of space are really hot, like areas around stars. But the further away you get from stars, the more spread out particles are, making those areas of space pretty chilly. Number 9 is our planet's shape. No, it's not flat, but it's not a perfect sphere either. Yeah, it bulges at the equator because of our planet's wild spin. It's like Earth is doing its own little dance. And because of this bulging, launching spaceships from the equator is much easier than from the poles. Now, when it comes to sound in space, it's a bit of a tricky situation. You might think that no one can hear you scream, but that's not entirely accurate. The thing is, sound needs something to travel through, like air or water. In space, things are super spread out, so all those epic space battles and galactic explosions would be completely silent. Yet there are some places in space with enough particles for sound to travel through. For example, you can hear the black hole at the center of the Perseus Galaxy Cluster. Another myth is about zero gravity. That's not a thing. There's still some gravity hanging around the International Space Station, about 90% of what we feel on good old Earth. But astronauts get to float around because they're basically free-falling around the planet. And let's be real, Hollywood's version of space travel is not factual. Sure, orbits are a thing, but different altitudes mean different speeds. So moving from one orbit to another isn't exactly a walk in the park. You can't just push yourself in the right direction and hope for the best. You gotta take those orbital velocities into account. This reminded me of the 2013 movie Gravity and how Sandra Bullock tried to survive in space. Hollywood sure added some fuel to these myths. Yet again, who can blame them? Back in 1976, NASA's Viking 1 spacecraft snapped a photo of a curious rock formation on Mars that looked suspiciously like a face. Some folks out there claimed that it must have been proof of extraterrestrial life on the red planet, but NASA had a different take. According to the space agency, the face was nothing more than a bunch of rocks piled up in such a way that the shadows they cast created an illusion of facial features. It turns out it was just a regular hill that got a little too much credit for being photogenic. The solar system stays in place. Lie! It's zooming through space at a speed of 140 miles per second, which means that it's whizzing through the cosmos faster than a cheetah chasing its prey. It takes us 230 million years for the solar system to complete a full orbit around the Milky Way. It's a good thing it isn't getting a speeding ticket, because that would be one astronomical fine, eh? Without the sun, planets would be pretty chilly. We're talking about temperatures as low as negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit. Brr. But with the sun around, the planets get to enjoy much more livable temperatures. Of course, not all planets are created equal. Mercury, for example, is the closest to the sun. Venus, on the other hand, is farther away, but somehow manages to be even hotter than Mercury. The distance from the Sun isn't the only factor that affects a planet's temperature. Other things like the planet's size and reflectivity also come into play. So Mercury being the hottest planet in our solar system is a false proposition. 
No, just because it's the closest one to the sun doesn't mean it's the hottest. Even though we've been deceived in some ways, that doesn't make space any less amazing. It's still a vast, beautiful, and utterly fascinating part of our universe. And there's still so much we have yet to discover. Who knows, maybe one day we'll really discover little green people out there. Or maybe we'll find out something even more incredible. Until then, we'll just have to keep dreaming and exploring. There, you got 14 things on our list. Do you have any other space myths to debunk? You may not have known this, but the Earth once had rings. Usually, Saturn is the planet that comes to mind when we think about rings. However, once upon a time, Earth could have had its own band of dusty particles. It was due to a phenomenon called ring ray, really. Our planet was surrounded by lots of little rocks and dust, perhaps the remnants of a hypothesized ancient planet, Theia. This protoplanet could have existed in the early solar system, and scientists assume that one day it could have collided with the early Earth. In that case, huge remnants of this collision would form our precious moon, and smaller rocks would result in the rings. In any case, the particles were pulled toward Earth's surface by gravity. All this happened around 4.5 billion years ago, shortly after Earth's formation. We know about them thanks to various sources. For example, we found some tiny glass beads in ancient rocks, which might have formed due to intense heat during ring particles' entry into Earth's atmosphere. We also found things like traces of isotopes in ancient rocks. Now, these rings would be much smaller than Saturn's, though, and weren't icy like Saturn's, so they weren't glowing. Our rings were mostly made of rock and dust. Scientists believe that they started around 620 miles above sea level, extending to the Roche limit. They'd be farther away from Earth than our International Space Station and most satellites. From the equator, the rings look like a straight line across the sky. But if you move north or south, they widen, creating a celestial arc. Near the North Pole, they would gain a subtle twilight effect. But unlike Saturn's rings that endure, Earth's were fleeting. Blame the sun! Earth's proximity caused water ice particles, potential ring makers, to turn into gas, leaving no bling behind. Ultraviolet light from the sun stripped away the rest. But what if Earth kept those rings? Imagine seeing this celestial spectacle day and night. Visually, it would be stunning, floating elegantly above our planet. During the day, we'd be adorned with their shimmer, and at night, they would be so bright and mesmerizing that they would even outshine the full moon. However, their impact on our lives wouldn't be that cool. First of all, the luminosity reflected off the rings might confuse nocturnal creatures, like dung beetles or swallow-tailed gulls. They're guided by the starlight, so poor creatures would be very confused by all this extra glow. This would disrupt their natural behaviors. The shadow cast by the rings could mess with our weather patterns as well. It would affect sunlight levels and pose a challenge for photosynthesis. Temperatures on the planet would change depending on the thickness and composition of the rings. They would impact our seasons and, potentially, cause even cooler winters and hotter summers. Satellites in Earth orbit might have faced some chaos as well. Space rocks hurtling at them could spell trouble for our high-tech companions. Perhaps things would be better if we kept them initially and evolved with them already existing, adapted to them. But if they suddenly appeared right now, it would cause tons of problems. Well, good thing that only Saturn has rings now. Or maybe not only Saturn. Its glowing bands and the famous Cassini division are visible even through a small telescope or binoculars of an amateur astronomer. They're super old and might have formed back at the times when dinosaurs roamed Earth. But in reality, all four giant planets in our solar system – Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune – have them. Their stunning sets of rings are composed of tons of tiny dust particles, a mix of rocks and ice, ranging from tiny bits to sizes as big as a house. It varies from planet to planet, and each of them has its own material makeup. To find out more about this makeup, we can simply look at them. Some particles are as tiny as sand grains, while others are as big as double-decker buses. We also look at how reflective they are and how much they sparkle. 
Saturn's rings, for example, are mostly water ice, and they look like sparkly frozen droplets. Jupiter's rings, however, are more dusty with fine rocky particles, similar to asteroids. Uranus keeps its ring material a secret, but it's dark and not so sparkly, hinting it's not water ice. Instead, it could be carbon or carbon-containing dust, maybe even charcoal. And Neptune takes it up a notch. Its rings are even darker, suggesting superfine dust, maybe carbon or methane ice. Scientists also study what sort of light these particles emit. They split this light into a spectra and look at the ring's secrets. For example, water ice, iron, and organic tholins are given the rings a reddish tint. And these giants are not the only ones in the universe who have this cool feature. For example, there's a planet way beyond our solar system called J1407b. It has rings 200 times wider than Saturn's, and it looks insane. The planet was called Super Saturn by NASA. On the other end, there's an object with only two tiny rings called 10,199 Car Iclo. If the Super Saturn is most likely a giant with huge gravity, then this thing is very tiny. It's not even a planet. It's the so-called centaur, which is what we call small celestial bodies. In the case of faraway planets, usually we find their rings thanks to radio waves. All planets or satellites send out radio signals. When these signals pass through the rings around them, it results in a weird and pretty crazy symphony. The size and weight of particles in the rings decide the notes. For example, lighter particles, like aluminum, have their own groove, which is different from iron's. Now, the true mystery is how they're formed at all. Each of the planets in our solar system has its own ring history. In Saturn's case, scientists thought that maybe it had some huge moon, and then this moon broke apart for some reason, after a collision, for example, resulting in fascinating rocky bands. But if we sum up all the rocks, they don't result in a big enough object. So that theory most likely isn't true. They might have appeared because of the collision, but between some other objects. Jupiter's faint rings come from dust particles flung into orbit by micrometeorites. Neptune has not really rings, but rather arcs. They're not complete circles around a planet, but just parts of the circle. They're influenced by the gravitational pull of the moon Galatea. And finally, Uranus's mysterious rings, like red and blue ones, puzzle scientists. We have no idea where they came from. Same with Super Saturn and a centaur we mentioned before. The rings in our solar system have their own future. The sad truth is that Saturn will lose its iconic rings one day. NASA's Cassini spacecraft showed that they're slowly being pulled into the planet by gravity and magnetic fields. It happened so fast that Saturn's ring ring could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool every half hour. So one day, what was once a spectacular sight stretching 22 times the length of Earth will shrink to almost nothing becoming just a tiny part of Saturn. But hey, don't worry, despite the speed, it will take about 1 to 300 million years for all the rings to fully vanish. But there's an upside. Mars might gain its own rings one day, although it will take a long time too. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars could witness its moon Phobos breaking apart and forming a dazzling band around the planet. The pieces that don't contribute to the ring will create craters on the Martian surface. So let's hope we won't live on this planet by that time. Scientists in NASA hope to study the rings of different planets better in the future. In the meantime, the James Webb Space Telescope will keep scanning and analyzing them. Let's hope that we'll learn more about their mysteries and our solar system's history. The protective shield of our planet decays and eventually fails. So do our satellites. First, communication satellites in the highest orbits go down. Next, astronauts in low Earth orbit can no longer contact their mission control center. And finally, hazardous, relentless cosmic rays start bombarding everything on Earth, causing havoc and devastation. Are these the terrifying consequences of the planet's magnetic field reversal we're going to face? Right now, as you're watching this video, Earth's north magnetic pole is extremely out of whack. It's so serious 
that scientists will have to update the global magnetic field model released a mere four years ago. Does it all mean that the magnetic pole of our planet will flip soon? Well, be patient, we'll figure it out a bit later. You see, the magnetic pole is moving quite erratically from the Canadian Arctic towards Siberia. And these movements are very unpredictable. But it's normal for the pole to be moving. There are long-term records from London and Paris that prove that the North Magnetic Pole moves randomly around the rotational North Pole over periods of several hundred years. But the most astonishing thing about its movement is that it's speeding up. Around the mid-1990s, the magnetic pole unexpectedly accelerated from a bit over 9 miles to 34 miles a year. And recently, the pole crossed the international dateline, moving toward the eastern hemisphere. The European Space Agency launched extremely accurate magnetic field satellites in 2013. Thanks to them, researchers have superb data they can use not only to make magnetic field maps, but also to update them every 6 to 12 months. That's how they were able to notice that the core field was weakening too. It might be a sign that the planet's magnetic field is about to flip. To understand this process better, we need to figure out how the core field works. Let's say we've got a bar magnet that runs through the center of our planet and has a north and a south pole. This magnet is incredibly strong, representing about 75% of the intensity of our planet's magnetic field at the surface. Our bar magnet is not only moving, but is also getting weaker, by about 7% every century. Admittedly, this bar isn't the perfect representation of the core field. It's more like electric currents generating Earth's magnetic field. Still, this model makes it easier to see what's happening to our planet now. The magnetic field of our planet plays an important role in protecting us from dangerous radiation and geomagnetic activity, which is the product of the interaction between the solar wind and Earth's magnetosphere. Earth's magnetic field also moves. Scientists have been studying and tracking the movement of the magnetic poles for hundreds of years. The historical motions of these poles indicates changes in the global geometry of the magnetic field of our planet and they may point to the beginning of the field reversal too. That's what the flip between the north and south magnetic poles is sometimes called. You see, if the north magnetic pole moves a bit, it isn't a big deal. But a complete reversal might have a serious impact on the climate of our planet, as well as modern technology. Luckily, such flips don't happen overnight. The entire process stretches over thousands of years. Plus, even though the magnetic pole weakens during a pole reversal, it doesn't disappear completely. So those scary events from the beginning of the video aren't likely to happen to us. The magnetosphere will continue protecting the planet from cosmic rays and charged solar particles, even though there might be some amount of particulate radiation that will make it to Earth's surface. Magnetic fields are generated by moving electric charges. If some material allows these charges to easily move in it, it's called a conductor. Metal is a great conductor, and we often use it to transfer electric currents from one place to another. In this case, the electric current is negative charges called electrons moving through the metal. The current is what generates a magnetic field. Earth has a liquid iron core. In other words, there are layers and layers of conducting material inside our planet. Currents of charges are constantly moving through the core, and the liquid metal is also moving and circulating there, generating the magnetic field. This magnetic field, in turn, produces something resembling a bubble around the planet. It's called the magnetosphere, and it's located above the uppermost part of the atmosphere. This layer shields and deflects high-energy cosmic radiation, which otherwise would be extremely dangerous to people and other forms of life on Earth. The magnetosphere also interacts with the ionosphere, the layer of our planet's atmosphere containing loads of ions and free electrons and capable of reflecting radio waves. The interaction between these two layers and the magnetized solar winds is what scientists call space weather. The solar wind is normally mild, and there's no space weather whatsoever. But sometimes, the sun starts shedding gargantuan magnetized clouds of gas that can accelerate to incredible speeds. 
They're called coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. They're ejected from the sun over the course of several hours. CMEs usually look like giant twisted ropes and can occur spontaneously. Their frequency varies according to the 11-year-long solar cycle. For example, at a solar minimum, you can observe one ejection per day. And when the sun is in its most active phase, there might be three CMAs per day. Coronal mass ejections disrupt the calm flow of the solar wind and cause serious disturbances that can damage stuff, both in space near Earth, like satellites, and on the planet's surface. If coronal mass ejections make it to Earth, their interaction with the magnetosphere generates geomagnetic storms. Those can trigger auroras, happening when a stream of energized particles hits the atmosphere and lights up. And then there are also solar flares. They develop more rapidly and with much more energy than coronal mass ejections. Solar flares often occur soon after coronal mass ejections. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison to solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot, with temperatures reaching several million degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. The star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. A powerful solar storm can potentially cause a devastating global blackout on Earth. If not for the Earth's magnetosphere, the effects of the sun's activity would be much more devastating. Luckily, the magnetosphere deflects most of the solar material hurtling towards our planet from our star at a speed of over 1 million miles per hour. But even so, during space weather events, there's a lot of hazardous radiation near Earth. It can potentially harm astronauts and spacecraft. Plus, space weather can damage large conducting systems, for example, pipelines and power grids, by overloading currents running inside them. Scientists regularly map and track the overall orientation and shape of our planet's magnetic field. To do it, they use local measurements of the field's orientation and magnitude. That's why they've been able to conclude that the location of the North Magnetic Pole has moved by almost 600 miles since the first measurements were taken in 1831. The magnetic field of our planet reverses on a time scale varying between 100,000 to 1 million years. One can tell how often it happens by looking at volcanic rocks at the bottom of the ocean. They capture the orientation and strength of Earth's magnetic field at the time of their creation. So, dating those rocks gives us a good picture of how our planet's magnetic field has evolved over time. From a geological point of view, field reversals happen quite fast, but they are extremely slow from a human perspective. A complete reversal normally takes a couple of thousand years, but during this time, the orientation of the magnetosphere may shift, exposing more of Earth to cosmic radiation. Such events tend to change the concentration of ozone in the atmosphere. In any case, scientists can't say for sure when the next field reversal will happen. But they keep mapping and tracking the movement of our planet's magnetic north. By the way, the Earth isn't the only planet with a magnetic field. Gas giants, like Jupiter, also have a conducting metallic hydrogen layer that generates their magnetic fields. Jupiter's internal magnetic field prevents the solar wind from interacting directly with the planet's atmosphere. Now, I don't want to spook you, but there's a chance that our entire Milky Way galaxy is located in the so-called space void. It's a region where there's relatively little matter compared to other corners of the known universe, and it's much less dense than it is elsewhere in the universe. In other words, we might exist in an air bubble in a cake. If that's true, it would mean that we're even lonelier than we thought. Hmm. In our universe, all the galaxies are constantly moving away from each other. In order to understand how far they move away, scientists use something called the hubble Lemaitre constant. It's like a speedometer, but for galaxies. However, there's a cosmic mystery called the Hubble tension. 
is challenging what we know about the universe's expansion. Scientists used to consider the Hubble Lemaitre constant a reliable guide, but our recent observations question this reliability. The speeds we see in real life don't match up with the distances we calculated and expected. They aren't sure why these measurements don't add up. Researchers followed the moves of supernovas and saw that the universe seems to expand faster around us than it does overall, as if it's actively avoiding us specifically. Hmm. After considering this, they began to assume that we might all live in a cosmic void. Cosmic voids are vast, empty spaces between galaxies, kind of like between my ears. They make our entire world look like a big sponge. Now, let's go back to the beginning, just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Right after the beginning of everything, the universe was a hot, compressed plasma. It only had very tiny variations in density, called quantum fluctuations. After the Big Bang, the universe began to expand. Those quantum fluctuations grew together with it, creating regions of varying matter density. Because of that, the universe didn't expand everywhere uniformly. Instead, little claps of matter began to gather together over a long period of time, creating massive structures, galaxies. Galaxies are arranged in huge walls and filaments with enormous gaps in between. And these gaps are voids, also known as dark space. Now, these voids aren't truly empty. In fact, they actually hold more than 15% of the amount of matter found on average throughout the entire universe. They still contain gas, dust, dark matter, and even stars and galaxies. However, they have less density than regions with galaxies, about a tenth of the average matter density, which is why we consider them nearly empty. Usually, they'll have a diameter ranging from about 30 to 300 million light years. That is an enormous distance, even on a space scale. For comparison, most planets and nebulas we found so far have a distance of hundreds and rarely thousands of light years away from us. In the case of voids, if you were in the middle of one, it would just look like seemingly eternal darkness. The closest stars would be so far away that they would be almost invisible to you. Some of them are especially large. They're known as supervoids. The largest known one was creatively named Giant Void. Ooh. It's so big, it's impossible for us to even imagine. 1.5 billion light years away, with a diameter of 1 to 1.3 billion light years. Yeah, it's basically a big dark vacuum. But even this giant vacuum isn't entirely empty. The giant void houses 17 separate galaxy clusters within its expanse. However, it might not be the biggest emptiness in our universe. There's this thing called the CMB cold spot. It's this unusually large and chilly area of our universe that we saw through the microwaves. It really stood out on the map of our universe with its unexpectedly low temperatures, and scientists have spent many years trying to figure out what the thing is. In 2015, scientists proposed that this place might be a supervoid, and probably the largest one ever. Being even more original than this one, they called it the Great Void. If it's true, this place would be an emptiness of about 1.8 billion light years in diameter, about a thousand times larger than typical voids. Not everyone thinks that's possible, so scientists keep arguing over this one. There's another interesting theory going about this place. One researcher suggested that this place might have been a trace on our collision with a parallel world. It's a pretty bold hypothesis, but unfortunately, there's no way for us to confirm or deny it with our current technologies. In any case, as the universe expands, these voids will grow, and the walls connecting galaxy clusters will stretch and break. Eventually, the voids will merge, leaving gravitationally bound galaxy clusters as islands in the expanding emptiness. In other words, sooner or later, the great emptiness will consume everything in our world. So, it turns out, we might be a rare occasion in a supervoid, one of the 15% of matter. This would explain why we're surrounded by relatively few galaxies. This discovery, if true, challenges the standard model of cosmology, which we created with Albert Einstein's help. It would mean that gravity in general behaves differently than what we expected. According to the standard model, such a significant underdensity shouldn't exist. 
Because of that, scientists will have to explore and consider this idea thoroughly. It might just challenge our very basic understanding of physics. The scientists call this the local hole. The discovery of the local hole may hold clues to explaining the Fermi paradox. Maybe in this specific part of the universe, where we hang out, the chance of intelligent life developing anywhere nearby is very low. Perhaps all of the sentient beings hang out somewhere beyond our super void. But that doesn't mean we should lose hope, or that life anywhere nearby is impossible. In fact, life in the universe might be much more common than we previously thought. We know that the inner planets, like Mercury and Venus, are inhospitable due to extreme conditions. However, Venus looks interesting because, even though it's a crazy toxic planet, scientists believe that it was very Earth-like in the past. It could have even hosted life. Unfortunately, it was too close to the Sun and all the nice conditions evaporated over time. But there's a possibility of microbial life surviving in its high-altitude clouds. Mars, a cold desert, also might have been a friendlier place in the past with rivers and lakes. Though now it lacks a protective atmosphere, ancient life might have existed there. In that case, it would leave potential fossils and underground microbes could still survive. We've discovered some signs of them, but are still debating whether this stuff was truly organic or not. The gas giants, like Jupiter and Saturn, and ice giants are not ideal for life. But their moons offer hope. Europa has an ocean beneath its icy surface, making it a potential hotspot. Encephalus releases water into space, carrying complex molecules that hint at interesting possibilities. And Titan is especially unique. It has liquid bodies on its surface, rivers and lakes of hydrocarbons. While its frigid temperatures aren't great for life, Scientists ponder if it might host life with a different kind of chemistry. However, it will take us decades to check all these celestial bodies and study them properly. We haven't sent anything so far since the times of Voyager 2. But if we're lucky, we might explore our solar system during the 21st century. We might explore our solar system during the 21st century. In any case, there's a lot of potential for life even in our solar system alone, not even mentioning all the planets and galaxies we found nearby. Our estimates suggest that the observable universe, the one we can see, might host around 5.3 trillion habitable worlds. One of the most likely candidates so far is Kepler-186f. It's a potential Earth-like planet, just 10% larger than Earth. This planet orbits a red dwarf star, which is a star a bit dimmer, colder, but more long-living than our Sun. And it's only about 490 light-years away, which may sound like a lot, but remember what distances we've discussed with supervoids. So even if we really are in a supervoid, we're still lucky to have many galaxies and planets around. And if one day, we'll find a way to travel through the universe, leaving the local hole probably wouldn't be a problem. Now imagine a place where a single day lasts longer than a whole year. On Venus, a day, meaning one full spin on its axis, is as long as 243 Earth days. And what's even weirder, despite the fact that Venus is experiencing a never-ending day, it has a shorter year than Earth. While Earth takes about 365 days to complete one orbit around the Sun, Venus does it in just 225 days. So somehow, for Venus, a day is more epic than a whole year. Venus is a strange planet in general. It's called Earth's twin because of how alike we are, although it's a bit smaller than Earth. But there are some drastic differences, too. For example, it spins in the opposite direction, which means the sun there rises in the west and sets in the east. And Venus isn't the only one who dances to its own rhythm. Uranus does that, too. And finally, Venus is quite crazy in terms of its atmosphere. When you stand on Earth, you don't really feel the weight of the air around you. Well, on Venus, that feeling would be like having an elephant sitting on your shoulders. Venus has 90 times the atmospheric pressure of Earth. The atmosphere there is a thick layer of toxic gases. For example, carbon dioxide that's released by all the volcanoes. It presses down with incredible force. This results in very hot temperatures. No wonder it'll take a long time before we'll be able to stand on this planet. 
Meanwhile, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, has an even more speedy orbit than Venus. It completes a full journey around the Sun in just about 88 Earth days. However, it has a slow spin on its axis, which means that one day on Mercury takes about 176 Earth days, basically half a year. Just like with Venus, a day there takes much longer than a year. Since it's closest to the Sun, no wonder Mercury experiences some super-extreme temperature swings. Daytime temperatures can soar up to a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. But wait for the sunset. At night, it drops to freezing minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh. That's because Mercury doesn't have a thick atmosphere like we do, so the heat doesn't distribute across the planet evenly. If one side is in the dark, it'll be super cold, and the other side will be scorching hot, just like if you let a regular big rock lie down under the sun for a while. In fact, it's so cold that there might even be some ice on it. Look at the planet's north polar region, especially those sunlit yellow spots inside craters. These are indications of water ice. Turns out, water is much more common in space than we thought. Mars is often dubbed the Red Planet. It earns this nickname from the abundance of iron oxide, or rust, covering its surface. The iron-rich minerals create a rusty red hue that paints the Martian landscape. But it turns out, Mars isn't just red. If you were standing on Mars, you'd witness desert-like butterscotch terrain with caramel and golden glows, some brown, and even a glimpse of a slight greenish hue. Mars also has the biggest mountain in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons, standing at a staggering height of about 13.6 miles tall. It's even taller than Mount Everest. It was formed by the volcanic eruption yielding low-viscosity lava, creating a shield-like structure. Since Mars is covered in sand, it's also famous for its crazy dust storms. But it turns out they're even more insane than we thought. These storms can last for months. While they might present challenges for future human missions, they also contribute to the planet's mesmerizing appearance when observed from afar. And not only storms, but even its own Mars quakes. Also known as seismic tremors, they were first detected by NASA in 2019. Unlike earthquakes that are often triggered by tectonic plate movements, Martian quakes are thought to result from the cooling and contracting of the planet's interior. It's interesting how similar, yet how different the planets are. Saturn's iconic rings might hold a secret link to Earth's ancient past. The rings are composed mainly of ice particles and debris and are estimated to be relatively young in space terms, perhaps just a few hundred million years old. Now, there are some theories that propose that they were born after some catastrophic event. For example, the collision of two large moons or the breakup of a comet. What's interesting is that this timeline coincides with the age of the dinosaur's demise on Earth. Could there be a connection? <laughs> Who knows? By the way, while Saturn takes the crown for its rings, it's not the only planet in our solar system sporting them. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own set of rings, although they might not be as visible and cool as Saturn's. However, there's something where Saturn truly stands out – the magnificent hexagon at its North Pole. It's a colossal six-sided figure. Each side of this incredible structure measures around 9,000 miles long, which is 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. Scientists aren't sure how it was formed or why. They think it might be due to varying wind speeds. Or maybe it's shaped by a localized, slow, meandering jet stream. So far, it remains another of Saturn's mysteries. Much like Saturn's hexagon, Jupiter also has its own weird spot. It's called the Great Red Spot. This is a storm that's been raging for at least 350 years and is larger than Earth itself. Despite its name, the spot's coloration has varied over the years, ranging from brick red to pale salmon. Scientists continue to study this enduring storm, unlocking the mysteries of its persistence and ever-changing hues. Meteorologically, the Great Red Spot is a powerhouse. It generates enormous pressure in Jupiter's southern hemisphere. Meanwhile, Jupiter itself is a powerhouse when it comes to magnetic fields. Its magnetic influence is colossal. It extends far beyond the planet itself and creates one of the largest and strongest magnetic fields in our solar system. Because of that, 
Jupiter is a source of intense radiation and mesmerizing auroras. While Earth's northern lights are breathtaking, Jupiter has something to offer too. The magnetic field interacts with charged particles from Jupiter's moons and the solar wind. This creates visually striking auroras near its poles. But compared to Earth, the scale of these auroras is incredible, like nothing we've seen on our planet. But even having a cool big spot isn't a unique feature in our solar system. A stormy giant Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from the Sun, also has its great dark spot. Just like Jupiter, it's a massive vortex in Neptune's atmosphere. But unlike its Jupiter counterpart, this spot tends to come and go because of Neptune's dynamic and ever-changing weather patterns. Neptune, together with Uranus, is known as an ice giant. And just like other giants, it boasts some of the most ferocious winds in our solar system. Its supersonic winds can get faster than 2,200 miles per hour. What a drama queen! But this explains its thick cloud formations. By the way, if you ever dreamed of a planet raining diamonds, you might want to visit this planet. Deep within Neptune's atmosphere, where pressures are extreme, scientists theorize that carbon atoms are compressed and form diamonds. And then, these diamonds might be raining down. What a unique touch to stormy weather! Neptune's moons got from their parent with the weird weather. For example, its largest moon, Triton, has a touch of cryovolcanism. Instead of spewing molten rock like Earth's volcanoes, Triton's cryovolcanoes erupt with a mix of water, ammonia, and nitrogen. Picture it as icy geysers shooting material into space. Seems like in our solar system alone, each planet has its own quirks and interesting qualities. Let's hope that we discover some more interesting things in outer space in the future. The soil beneath your feet is red and dry. The place is freezing cold. Rusty colored dust is floating in the air. You make one step, then another. It's hard to move because of the thick layer of dust your feet are sinking into. You're on Mars, and you've come here after hearing some absolutely incredible news. These days, the so-called red planet indeed looks dry and dusty. But scientists think that this world might have been very different a long, long time ago. They have found some evidence of a huge ocean that could have existed on the surface of Mars about 3.5 billion years ago. And this ocean probably covered hundreds of thousands of square miles. It all started with numerous satellite images of the surface of the red planet. They were snapped at different angles. As a result, researchers managed to construct a relief map of the area. They charted out more than 4,000 miles of specific formations that had most likely been carved by rivers. Those formations could also be channels once carved out on the sea floor. Scientists used the data gathered by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2007. They analyzed the thickness of the ridges and their angles and locations. Their main goal was to explore the topographical depression called Aeolus Dorsa. It turned out that all those years ago, this part of the red planet had been undergoing a series of constant changes. They could have been caused by the rapid movement of rocks, pulled around by currents and rivers, as well as noticeable increases in sea level. Researchers also noticed a pretty clear boundary that separated the southern highlands of Mars, elevated and highly cratered, from the smooth lowlands of the planet. It looked very similar to a shoreline left by a ginormous ocean. This all likely means that in ancient times, there indeed was an ocean on the surface of Mars, and a large one at that. What's even more exciting is that the existence of such an ocean might mean the existence of life. This discovery can tell scientists a lot about the ancient climate on the red planet, as well as its evolution. We now know there had to be a period on Mars when the planet was quite warm, and its atmosphere was thick enough to keep so much liquid water. What's even more incredible, the climate in the northern hemisphere of Mars three billion years ago could have resembled the one we have on Earth nowadays. But then, where is this ocean now? What happened to it? Perhaps the climate of the red planet was becoming cooler, and the surface of the ocean froze. There's a theory claiming that these days, 
the ocean remains in its frozen state, deep under a layer of rock, debris, and dust under a northern plain called Vastitis Borealis. Or the ocean's waters could have been lost to the atmosphere and eventually space through the process of atmospheric sputtering. During this process, atoms get knocked away from the atmosphere after colliding with high energy particles coming from the sun. Anyway, the theory of an ocean that once covered a substantial part of Mars's northern hemisphere hasn't been confirmed yet. Scientists are still arguing about its existence. As for now, Mars is a very cold world with an average temperature of negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. The ocean that might have existed on Mars isn't the only awesome thing about this planet. Let's speak about those sandstorms raging on the red planet. In movies, they're depicted as incredibly powerful forces of nature, destroying astronauts' camps and tearing their spaceships into pieces. But how much of it is true? Mars is indeed infamous for producing dust storms so massive they can be seen by telescopes on Earth. They sometimes cover continent-sized areas and can last for weeks at a time. But besides them, there are much rarer storms that occur once in three Mars years, which is about five and a half Earth years. Such storms are larger and much more intense than regular ones. They encircle the entire planet. That's why scientists call them global dust storms. At the same time, it's unlikely that even a global dust storm could cause serious harm to astronauts or their equipment. Even though Martian storms are massive, the wind speed reaches 60 miles per hour tops. That's less than half the speed of most hurricane force winds on Earth. Plus, this comparison of wind speeds can be kind of misleading. The atmosphere on Mars is just 1% or so as dense as the atmosphere on our planet. It means that the wind there needs to blow much faster to cause any damage or even fly a kite. Now let's move to the next amazing phenomenon spotted on the red planet. When you look at it from a distance, it looks like an eye. There are even some winding channels that look like veins running through the eyeball. But the closer you get, the less the formation looks like an actual eye. It's actually a giant crater, almost 19 miles in diameter. Around the crater, which looks as if it has a pupil, there are other, even bigger craters. They likely formed billions of years ago. That's when Mars had to withstand multiple attacks of space rocks. But why is the eye crater darker than the surrounding landscape? Scientists think that once, water filled the ginormous pit. Remember those channels? They were likely carrying that water. And since the crater was filled with water, it stopped some substances and minerals from eroding away. Your next destination is Valles Marineris. That's an enormous canyon, or rather, a canyon system that runs along Mars's equator. It stretches for more than 2,500 miles. It's also four times as deep as the famous Grand Canyon on Earth. The thing is so huge, it could span the entire continental United States from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Most scientists think that Valles Marineris is a huge tectonic crack in the crust of the red planet. It could have formed when the planet was cooling down in the distant past. Another breathtaking sight on Mars is the largest shield volcano in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons. It's more than 370 miles in diameter, which means it's almost the same size as the state of Arizona. The mountain is also 16 miles high and rimmed by incredibly tall cliffs. To imagine the sheer size of the volcano, let's make some comparisons. The largest volcano on Earth is Mauna Loa, around 2.6 miles high and 75 miles across, which actually sounds pretty impressive. But the volume of Olympus Mons is around 100 times larger than that of Mauna Loa. The Martian giant could swallow the whole chain of Hawaiian islands from Kauai to Hawaii. Scientists have been wondering for quite some time why this volcano is so large. It might be the result of lower surface gravity and higher eruption rates. Or the reason may be the red planet's crust, 
which is very different from Earth's. On our planet, the crust is made up of 15 to 20 moving tectonic plates. As plates move over hot spots that produce lava, new volcanoes form, and the already existing ones become extinct. That's why lava can get to the surface through many vents. But on Mars, the crust isn't broken into the same tectonic plates as on Earth, and the lava has nothing to do but pile in one very, very large volcano. Now, if you visited Mars and decided to go on an evening stroll, you'd witness a strange phenomenon. It occurs on the red planet after sunset, when temperatures fall below negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. A bizarre, mysterious glow spreads across the Martian sky. Unfortunately, without special equipment, you wouldn't be able to observe this soft glow. Visible only in ultraviolet light, this night glow is the result of chemical reactions that occur dozens of miles above the surface of the red planet. What if the sun went boom? Well, you can guess it would be super bad news for us. Hmm, this was sure a short video, huh? Nah, wait, I have more. If the sun blew up, chaos would ensue in our solar system. But scientists tell us that it will certainly happen one day. But why? How exactly would events unfold? And is it possible for us to somehow survive this event? Hey, let's delve into it. First of all, get ready for a journey to the sun's core. The sun's heart is packed with hydrogen atoms, having an out-of-this-world dance party. These atoms are so excited that they smash into each other with all their might. And when they collide, something magical happens. It's called nuclear fusion. And in this fusion fiesta, the hydrogen atoms combine to form helium atoms, a chemistry experiment on a grand scale. During this nuclear fusion, a teeny bit of mass from the hydrogen atoms is transformed into a massive amount of energy. It's Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared coming into play. Energy is unleashed in the form of light and heat, radiating outwards to brighten up the entire solar system. And once all these processes get going, a bunch of energized particles called photons join the fun. These photons are like tiny packets of light, bouncing and zipping around in all directions. They play a crucial role in carrying the sun's energy through space, illuminating our world and warming our cozy planet. But to keep all this going, so that atoms don't escape and create complete chaos, the sun's core needs to be under tremendous pressure. This pressure comes from the immense weight of the sun's outer layers pressing down on the core. The outer layers are squeezing the inner core. But the inner layers don't give up. The energy created from fusion and the bustling photon party tries really hard to escape the sun's core. But the core is so dense, like me, and the pressure is so big that the energy takes its sweet time to make its way out. It bounces around, gets absorbed, and re-emitted by other particles. Eventually, after a long time, it reaches the sun's surface and zooms off into space, reaching us as sunlight. So now you know how the sun works. Now what happens once it reaches the end of its life? Well, here's the twist. Our sun has a limited supply of hydrogen fuel. In about 5 billion years, it'll run out of its fuel. After that, the star will undergo some big changes. Now, pay attention, because there's a pretty good chance we're all going to miss this. First, the sun will puff up and become a red giant, exploding like a balloon. It will grow so big that it will swallow up the inner planets, including our beloved Earth. Talk about a sun taking up all the space. So we won't even see the end of our sun unless we move somewhere further away. After the red giant phase, the sun will shrink a bit. Its outer layers will fade away into space, leaving behind a beautiful planetary nebula. It'll be revealing its glowing core. Ooh! The core, now filled with helium, will start sounding weird. And will start fusing heavier elements like oxygen and carbon. These reactions won't be as energetic, like a party with less dancing and more chill vibes. Eventually, even the helium will be used up, and the sun will become a compact white dwarf, a stellar retiree enjoying its retirement home. Scientists estimate that the sun has about 7 to 8 billion years left before it dims its lights. Don't worry though, by that time, humanity might have traveled to far-off galaxies, 
or maybe even evolved into amazing space beings. So our sun won't go out with a bang like fireworks, it's not big enough to become a supernova or a black hole. Those stellar superstars need way more mass than our sun to pull off those cosmic tricks. But what if it blew up very suddenly, just like an abrupt event without any reason? Well, let's see. Imagine this, the sun goes boom and Earth is in for a wild ride. The event unleashes an insane amount of energy, sending a shockwave racing through space at the speed of light. It takes about 8 minutes for this shockwave to reach Earth. Why? Well, the Sun is a whopping 93 million miles away from us on average. So it takes a little over 8 minutes and 20 seconds for the Sun's light to travel all that distance and reach us. But let's talk about the event itself. It would be a great sight to witness, but sadly, it would also be the end. Roll credits. The crazy amounts of unleashed energy would cause the Sun to expand rapidly, again swallowing up the inner planets, including our Earth. And that's not all. Brace yourself for a massive burst of radiation. The sun would unleash a torrent of supercharged particles. We're talking about X-rays and gamma rays, the kind that can seriously mess things up. When these high-energy particles hit the atmosphere, they go wild, causing all sorts of chaos. They ionize the atmosphere, creating a ginormous electromagnetic pulse. This pulse is like a shockwave for electronic devices. It fries them, zaps them, and leaves them useless. So if your gadgets aren't protected, they're in for a rough time. Speaking of rough times, after that, it's instant vaporization for our planet. But the sun's grand finale just doesn't mess with Earth. It wreaks havoc on the entire solar system. That massive burst of energy would be crashing into everything in its path. Planets and other objects get knocked off of their cozy orbits, causing chaos and unpredictability. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter? Kapow! It's gone, obliterated, or scattered to the cosmic winds. And even planets that will survive this event will probably go off their orbits to wander somewhere. And let's not forget about the outer planets, like Jupiter and Saturn. These giants generate their own internal heat, which keeps them cozy and attracts lots of moons. But the sun's boom would steal their warmth turning them into incredibly cold places. And now that we've discussed how catastrophic all this would be for everything in our solar system, let's ask the logical question. Can humanity make it? The short answer is nope, we wouldn't make it. Everything would be wiped out, except maybe some sneaky bacteria hiding in the shadows. But in a crazy scenario where the sun gave us a heads up about its plans, we might have a fighting chance. If we knew in advance and had time to prepare, we could get our survival gears turning. So what could we do? Since Earth itself won't survive the sun's tantrum, we'd have to move somewhere. Remember how we mentioned that not all planets would be completely destroyed? Well, sadly, the ones closest to the sun, Mercury, Venus, and Earth would disappear. So the easiest option would be to move to some other solar system with its own Earth-like planet. But what if the Earth somehow managed to survive this catastrophe? Let's not think about how it happened and just discuss the consequences. Well, our climate would go crazy. During the first moments of the sun's kaboom, the radiation and particles would crank up the temperature big time, like a never-ending heat wave. We're talking major greenhouse effect. The oceans would evaporate, creating thick, fluffy clouds that trap heat and refuse to let it escape into space. And after that, without the sun's warm embrace, the Earth would quickly become an icy freezer. So we'd have to think outside the box. One idea would be to take shelter deep underground, where we won't be that much affected by radiation and sudden temperature changes. As you dig deeper, the temperature rises. So with the right tools and resources, humanity could hunker down in fortified bunkers, surviving for a couple of years without the sun's rays. Why just a couple of years? Well, remember how we said the Sun is a gravity center of our solar system? Without it, Earth would be adrift in search of a new center of gravity. Imagine our planet, our trusty satellite, the Moon, and all the other planets slowly floating away into space. Luckily, our trusty Sun is hanging in there, keeping us warm and shining for many more cosmic adventures to come. So we're safe for a few billion years. But it's always fun to imagine impossible scenarios. 
So stay tuned for more What Ifs. We've been dreaming about life on Mars for a long time. Not only about growing potatoes there in the future, but also about all the potatoes that could have been there in the past. Has there ever been life on Mars? Recently, scientists have found something that could be evidence of that. Let's find out what happened. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. A human hasn't set foot on Mars yet, but robots have set their wheels. The first spacecraft that visited the red planet were NASA Viking landers. They flew there back in 1976 and sent us a lot of interesting data. Back then, we didn't know anything about Mars. To us, it looked like a cold, lifeless desert. But since we're so similar, scientists began to wonder, has it always been like this? Or is it possible that once Mars used to be thriving and full of life? And in 2022, NASA's Mars rover Perseverance found something that could shed a light on this mystery. But first of all, what is Perseverance? Scientists have suggested that if there was life on Mars once, it's unlikely that it could simply disappear without a trace. It must have left some traces, perhaps underground, where they would be protected from radioactive solar tantrums and other nastiness. So we need to check the rocks. It's important to note that we aren't looking for life on Mars right now. There most likely isn't any. Instead, we want to look into the distant past of our twin planet. We're talking billions of years ago, when Mars could have been warm, green, and far from lifeless. In other words, we have to find dead microbes and various chemical compounds similar to ones on the Earth. This is the mission of our main character, Perseverance. It arrived on Mars in February of 2021. The spacecraft landed on the bottom of the 30-mile-wide Jezero crater. And after landing, it scooted over to the west, to the place that prompted scientists to choose Jezero for research. This place is a dried-up river delta, and this former river is already more than 3.5 billion years old. The Jezero crater itself was once a large lake. Yup, apparently there was life on Mars. And scientists have suggested that these places would be perfect as bodyguards of microbes. That's exactly what bacteria do on Earth. They hide, being still in the depths of lakes and ponds. So we could probably find traces there. The researchers believe that this particular lake has the highest scientific value in the entire mission. The highest chance to find rocks on which such bacteria could survive is here in Jezero. So Perseverance went to the delta. The row wasn't easy, though. The rover missed a little and landed further than planned. As one famous movie said, this little maneuver is going to cost us 51 years. Fortunately, Perseverance took only one year, and on the way, it was able to explore Jezero a little. The rover uses a complex built-in tool to explore the world. The tool is called Scanning Habitable Environments with Raman and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals, or just Sherlock. Boy, NASA sure loves its acronyms. As the device approached the delta, the signal of organic molecules became stronger. Soon, these signals were everywhere, and besides, they were the brightest that the scientists have ever seen. What does it mean? Elementary, my dear Watson. You know, Sherlock. It's time to dig. Since July 2021, Perseverance has drilled and collected four thin cores of sedimentary rock. The total number of collected rocks at the moment is 12. This is the first time in history that we're collecting something like this on another planet. These four cores were found on two rocks called Skinner Ridge and Wildcat Ridge. The first pair of cores, the ones from the Skinner Ridge, don't seem very interesting at first glance. They're quite close to what we can find in many places on Earth. However, if we look at them closer, we'll see that they're dotted with round grains of some dark material. These dark grains could have once been deposited on them by an ancient river, the same one that flowed into Jezero. It's possible that the river brought them from places hundreds of miles away from Jezero. And that's pretty cool. If we study these cores, we'll be able to learn even more about the far corners of Mars. Well, there are no corners on it, but you get the idea. Then, in April 2022, Perseverance did arrive at the Delta. And then scientists finally found what they were looking for. 
The discovery, to put it mildly, excited them. They found two more cores, which held organic substances. This pair was taken from the Wildcat Ridge. It's found very close to the Skinner Ridge, but the two rocks are quite different from each other. These samples are lighter in color and more uniform. Most likely, they're mudstone, an unusual rock similar to clay, but harder and unable to absorb water. They're also finer grain than the cores of the Skinner Ridge. Why does it matter? Because the finer the grains in the stone, the more likely it is that there may be some traces of a past life in it. On Earth, fine-grained stones most often lie on the bottoms of ponds and in similar places. There, they can preserve the remains of dead organisms and similar stuff for years. And this is exactly what we found on them. Additionally, according to scientists, there was more organic matter in these two cores than in any other place studied by Perseverance so far. It probably accumulated there while the lake was gradually evaporating billions of years ago. So, there really was life on Mars? Well, let's slow down a little. Organic substances are molecules holding carbon. And yes, on Earth, they're most often associated with life, but not always. Sometimes they can form as a result of other things. Therefore, we cannot say for sure whether there was life on Mars. We don't know if these molecules really remain from some Martian microbes, or if they're the result of some other things. But the discovery is still very significant. We have to literally keep digging this way. To learn more about this organic matter, scientists need to collect a couple more samples of fine-grained rock. It would also be great to study the material lying around these former reservoirs. Perseverance has already moved to another area, to a place with a beautiful name, Enchanted Lake. Now it needs to look for similar things there. It will also continue to study Lake Jezero. Eventually, Perseverance will climb to the top of the delta and then continue exploring ancient sites outside the crater. Sometime before the end of 2022, Perseverance will probably have six or more samples of the Martian cores. Unfortunately, its tools, though complex, are quite limited. This data alone won't be enough for us to get a complete picture. Therefore, NASA plans to send other spacecraft to Jezero in the coming years. Together with the European Space Agency, they're working on the next robotic mission, known as the Mars Sample Return. The name speaks for itself. These devices will arrive and take away all the test tubes from the old Prospector Perseverance. After that, these samples will be delivered to Earth, though not by Amazon Prime, and then scientists will be able to analyze them in advanced laboratories. However, all this will take a really long time. The launch of this mission is scheduled for 2027-2028, and the spacecrafts won't be able to return until 2033. But if everything goes well, it will be the first samples in history delivered to Earth from Mars. In other words, there's still enough space for research, literally. And yes, we don't yet know the true meaning of these finds. But that's why the entire mission was created, right? And who knows? Maybe in a few years we'll finally find out the truth about what happened on Mars billions of years ago. Ooh, check out the Martian! Made you look! to look.